Heidi Heitkamp made carbon capture a top priority of her tenure in the United States Senate. She helped marshal an improbable coalition of 25 senators, 18 Democrats, six Republicans, and one independent. And together they passed uh, some of the most consequential energy and climate legislation in a generation. For many of us, if not most of us in this room, Senator Heitkamp was our champion. Uh, on a personal note, and, and, and she'll, she won't remember this, but I first met Heidi as a freshman in college. She was a young elected North Dakota tax commissioner and uh, she was inspiring young people even then, myself included. Uh, she then became attorney general in North Dakota, served two terms. Some of you rem may remember she was the lead negotiator of the AG's settlement on the, on the tobacco settlement. Um, on another personal note, Heidi and I also ran together on the same ticket in 2012 in North Dakota. I uh, remember my fondest experience was the last week of the campaign. I think it was 45 rallies in five days around North Dakota. And at probably a half dozen of those, we actually talked about carbon capture, enhanced oil recovery, and storage in cafes and town halls. And people love it. It was great. And uh, as you all know, she won against all odds in that cycle. It was probably arguably the greatest Senate race of that cycle. I didn't fare quite as well. Um, Senator Heitkamp entered the Senate as the only member of Congress sig with significant professional experience in carbon capture utilization and storage. She had served for years, I don't remember how many years, but on the board of Dakota Gasification. As many of you know, Dakota Gas is one of the largest examples of carbon capture in the world generally and from coal specifically. The credibility that she derived from that long-standing personal experience, plus her bipartisan instincts, quickly elevated her to a leadership role on this and related issues. Upon leaving the Senate, Senator Heitkamp is immediately engaged with the same energy and tenacity she demonstrated in the Senate. We are very fortunate that, that she is remaining in the arena and so engaged, and we're equally fortunate to have her here with us today. Thank you, Heidi. So I'm gonna answer the question you've all been asking at lunch. Hang on, I brought up a little prop. What the heck is this? It's the Tetons, ladies and gentlemen. Aren't you proud of me? I figured that, I thought they couldn't have made Montana. I was trying to figure it out. Anyway, uh, now that we've got that straightened out, um, I <laughs> got myself all gummed up here. Um, I wanted to talk about um, kind of possibilities and, and why I continue to believe that even in a really, really incredibly polarized time, you can still get things done. And I would say, because my personal experience tells me that. So what is that personal experience? It's not just getting 45Q across the finish line, but it's also um, cutting a deal that I think is the second most important piece of climate legislation that happened in the last six years and that is the opening up of the oil export, um, uh, stopping the oil export ban and opening up international markets for oil that's produced in the lower 48. Why is that important here? Because it's important if you're going to have a symbiotic relationship with the oil industry, that the oil industry, especially shale, which is one thing that Vicki doesn't talk enough about, how um, her company has pioneered and not only been huge in, in uh, carbon capture and sequestration for enhanced oil recovery, but she's doing it in shale, which um, heretofore had not been something that a lot of um, organizations were doing. Um, I came, as, as Brad said, out of the, the um, experience of Dakota Gas. Dakota Gas is a large uh, coal uh, gas uh, plant um, invented and dreamed up in the late 70s when everybody thought natural gas was um, on its way completely to extinction. And this was a way to fight the oil embargo. And um, lots of federal dollars went into that project. And lo and behold, the minute they deregulated natural gas, people found a way to find natural gas and the economics of the plant didn't go so well. So um, what had to happen, um, Basin Electric, who was heavily invested, not from a dollar standpoint, but for putting up a whole electrical generation unit that was used to supply the gasification plant, 
had, a, had an acute financial interest, basically um, assumed the plant into its family, uh, included three outside directors, of which I was one of 12 years. But the more important part of this story is what happened before that, which is these innovators at Dakota Gas said, we've got to find a way to market byproducts um, from, the, from, the, um, uh, from the plant. And one of the byproducts they came up with was CO2. Pretty interesting, right? This was before there was any talk of actually getting credits, any talk of getting any kind of dividends under cap and trade. This was simply because CO2 was a marketable byproduct if we moved it up into the Weyburn field into Canada. And so uh, this relationship, long-term relationship, um, between the gas plant and the Weyburn field um, was created out of necessity of marketing byproducts out of the um, Dakota gasification plant. And it was an amazing exper experiment that resulted in a great deal of enhanced oil recovery, but also a great deal of profitability for Great Plains um, uh, coal gasification plant, but also for the Basin Electric family. Um, where they continue to struggle, and as you look at Boundary Dam, which is another carbon capture project at SAS Power, um, uh, competing for delivery of, of CO2 into that space, um, it, it, th the economics have changed somewhat for Basin Electric. But I, I'll, I'll tell you, um, one of the reasons why I got heavily involved in carbon capture early on in my tenure um, because I had seen it, and when people said it's vaporware, you guys remember that old uh, phase vaporware? If you ever managed a, a large um, computer development project, you'd know what that is when the consultant comes in and tells you everything that they're going to do for you by writing you a whole program, and you know it's vapor, it's not real, it doesn't exist. And I think a lot of people in this country believe that carbon capture, utilization, and sequestration is vapor. It's not real. And one of the things that conferences like this prove over and over again, it's real. It's real, it's being done every day in America. It's being done by innovators. There's huge amounts of investment headed in that direction. Not enough to get us to commercial scale on a lot of this effort. And so we need federal policies that promote and move this, um, this idea of carbon capture forward. So um, I'm not gonna talk to you about what. You got the what, right? It's right here. Um, you know, you don't need me to stand up here and give you per tons or uh, give you uh, uh, ideology on each one of these provisions, whether it's use it, whether it's transportation, whether it's infrastructure, whether it is um, flexibility on tax credits, it's all here. I am gonna talk about the why though, because the why is a critical piece of, um, of what you should be thinking about. You know, a lot of people come to this and a lot of people here come to this interested in carbon capture because you believe climate is an existential threat to the future of the planet and the future of our economy. So how many people here believe that you're here in this room because you care desperately, your number one priority is climate? About half the room. Okay, um, how many of you are here because you need to find a sustainable path forward for your industry with predictable, um, outcomes that will help you make long-term planning in your industry possible. Good job. And how many of you here, because you think carbon is actually a resource and not a pollutant, and it, it could pre it poten uh, present an incredible potential for economic development and economic potential in this country. This, this series of discussion makes you unique in the climate space because you see opportunity not only in addressing climate concerns, and we all know, and you heard from the previous speaker, emissions control is not enough. That's an important thing to remember, and you know why I remember it? Because that's the only way I got Sheldon Whitehouse to be a co-sponsor of 45Q. Think about it. Do you think Sheldon really would have done any of that if he, did, if he didn't believe to his core that if we don't develop these technologies and deploy these technologies on a, on a, on a transformational basis, on a commercial basis, that we in fact would um, achieve climate goals. He's all in on the fight. He's all in on this resource. And that's a tribute to the coalition that's been put together, but the fact that Sheldon actually does his homework and understands the challenges of meeting um, climate targets by leaving other technologies behind, by being ideological 
in his approach to it. I don't think Sheldon thinks he can afford to be ideological and just go with one source and one discussion. And so we need, first off, to figure out how. How do we do this? Well, 45Q is a great example because I started out um, when I uh, uh, went to the United States Senate. Most of you know I have a background in coal. North Dakota is a coal producing. Actually, it's lignite, as I say, BTUs with mud, mud and BTUs. Um, but, but, but it burns pretty good, and it generates a lot of electricity in my state. And we have a coal research um, element. Two cents of every ton goes into research. And we started very early on investing and in deploying in new technologies that would advance the industry, not just stay in the kind of generation space that we had been in the past. And so when we started on 45Q and the National Mining Association would come in and say, we need your vote, I said, you know, you always got my vote. If you want my leadership, you can't be hell no. You've got to understand the challenges because let me tell you, because you didn't come to the table, you're done. And the only path forward for you in coal is to find a way to join the table, join the discussion about how we're going to move forward um, in a carbon constrained world. Now, there's very, very enlightened, there's very enlightened coal companies, Peabody, Arch, Cloud Peak. They all see it in the future. But I want, and it's going to be a political comment, that's not who has the ear of the president. There's people who honestly believe that all we have to do is elect people who, who um, uh, uh, will advance a, a pro-coal rhetoric, and that's going to solve the problem. How many new coal-fired power plants are on the mix? How many of you think in the next 10 years we're going to build a huge coal-fired power plant? How many of you know that coal-fired power in this country, if you look at generation, is, is about 40 years old? The last one that was built was built by Basin Electric at Dry Fork, large scale, not counting the one in, in Spirit Lake, which was built by Great River, which Great River's here too, right? Anyway, so, so there are some innovators, because that's an innovative plant. But it's not enough to get people to make investments. In fact, there was just an article yesterday about EEI saying, guess what? We're not doing it. So you can, you can talk all you want. But think about if we said we could do it with back-end carbon capture, give you that reliable, redundant source of energy. We at least then have a fighting chance. And so um, I, I always remind the natural gas industry, the same thing I told the industry, the coal industry 15 years ago. You are on a path of unsustainability unless you get in the mix. And so this issue, the natural gas industry, has been very willing to engage in a discussion about what do we do with carbon capture if we're going to continue to generate electricity with natural gas. Now, the advantage they have is that we haven't found an alternative that provides the same level of redundancy and reliability. If you had told me in 1980 when I first started examining all this, and certainly um, beginning in 2000, that natural gas would be our primary source. You all remember natural gas prices, right? Riding the wave. up It's $11, it's $2, it's $11. With the advent of fracking, We've stabilized that fuel source, and that fuel source now has become the major source of generation of electricity. But you saw today Rebecca's great presentation, thank you so much, um, for um, uh, showing the, the need to address the industrial emissions. And so um, I will tell you the first use, use of 45Q in North Dakota is not going to be by a coal-fired power plant. It's going to be an ethanol plant that has the flexibility to work. And, you know, we, we're, we're fortunate we are in proximity with the oil industry, so they're going to capture the CO2 behind an ethanol plant. It's going to be used in enhanced oil recovery, and that, in hit, that, that is going to, in, in many ways, make their ethanol much more competitive into green markets of Oregon and California. And so don't think that it's not going to be used by industrial plants. We'll find a way to do that in states like North Dakota that have an opportunity for either sequestration or utilization in the oil field. But I will tell you, the single greatest thing that 45Q has done is put carbon capture, sequestration, and utilization on the climate map. People no longer, no longer doubt that we can do this. 
I was teasing uh, Brad, not really teasing. I should say it's real. We should do one like this that says it's real and each one of these projects that we're talking about and all this innovation, just be able to hand it out to the skeptics who say it's not real. It is real. And that education component is critical. I, the one thing I learned in Washington, D.C., and, and it's, uh, it's a throwback to opening up the oil export markets, um, lead with education. You know, we started with this idea, and when I said, I think that we can get it done in, in, in one year, in 2015, everybody laughed. They said, that can't happen. Only in Washington, if you come up with a good idea that no one has a logical argument against, do people say it should take five years to make a decision. Right? So, so we went to work, but we didn't go to work by introducing a bill and giving floor speeches. We started inviting people in. And the oil industry would sit down with anyone I told them to sit down with. That included Cory Booker, Brian Schatz, um, Sheldon Whitehouse, and they all got educated on what's happening with oil exports and what that means for the development of the oil industry and how we can displace oil from other less friendly sources. Um, Michelle Fortnoy, who um, probably would have been Secretary of Defense had Hillary won, came in and did testimony at the Banking Committee, um, well-known liberal, talking about how important it was to provide energy security. So we had every argument covered, but we did our homework beforehand. And so education is such a key component to this, and getting people to believe it's real. The last thing you want is Congress designing your needs, right? but you do want them to understand your needs, right? You do want them to understand how important it is. And, and then I would say clarity of the ask. This is a big document. You think you're gonna get it all? You think you could, yeah, good job. Eventually, right, eventually. Um, you know, we're engaged in a big debate right now in, in uh, politics. It's called the Green New Deal. And, you know, you can argue about whether that's um, vapor or whether that's real, whether that's well thought out in terms of policy. But one thing that you can't argue is that it, it, it has done a job in moving this issue to the forefront. And the question becomes, how does this issue fit within, how does a blueprint for carbon capture fit within the discussion on climate? How does agricultural um, credits fit within the discussion on climate? We all have an opportunity to have input in that discussion. And I think if we, if we sit back, simply criticize the Green New Deal, and not offer an alternative in terms of strategy, I think we will have missed this opening and this opportunity to really see a level of investment and bipartisanship. And the final thing I would say, how you get things done in Washington, is you build coalitions. Um, <laughs> I, when I was tax commissioner, I used to have this fight with John Dwyer, who was the head of Lignite Research or, uh, Lignite uh, Council, and, uh, which was the trade group for the Lignite industry in North Dakota. And we would argue every year, every legislative session about taxes, right? He'd always want them reduced, and I would go and argue as tax commissioner, you can't reduce them, they're paying a fair share, and we would get out charts, and we'd have the battle of the charts, and he never won. And I remember walking into a committee hearing, and I looked down, and I saw the railroad workers, I saw the Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, and I saw the trades, and I saw the utility unions, and I said, I'm done. I'm not gonna win this fight this time. Because he learned how to build a coalition that I couldn't fight. And so then we began negotiation. And so the one thing that this group has done is built an incredible coalition. There are brave environmental groups, and you should thank them, because this is not an easy, this is not an easy thing for them to engage in, but I think they understand that reasoned, reasonable public policy is critical to the development of, of um, the change that they need to prevent uh, climate catastrophe. And so they're looking for where is that spot where we can actually get things done. And so I would just say that the coalition is your greatest strength. The fact that every uh, idea of why, why are you here, is represented in this room with different ideas on what drives your participation. And there is an opportunity from all of this to look forward to actually getting something done 
in the next Congress. I don't think it's going to happen in this Congress. You might be able to get some tweaks to, to the extender package at the end. But the answer, the, the advice that I have for you is get ready. Get ready with what it is that you want to do and do not sit on the sidelines. You know, Vicki was very complimentary to me um, coming up here, but I'm going to throw it back at her. Do you know what would happen when we hit a snag on 45Q? I would pick up the phone, and I would call Vicki, who she always took my call, and she, I would say, can you make these calls? And she would make the calls. That doesn't happen in Washington. You call people and say, will you make the calls? Yeah, yeah, when I get around to it. And that, what that means is I'm not going to waste my political capital on this. I'm not going to use whatever, you know, uh, uh, political uh, strength I have that's in my, my political bank to try and promote this. You have to be all in. And everybody has to be all in. You, some of you here represent states that haven't been as engaged you should get engaged with your delegations. You should get engaged with your governor. You should get engaged telling the story, telling the story of how this is the sweet spot, not just on climate, but on economic opportunity for the great country that we live in. And that if we let this pass by us, we will have missed an opportunity to realize a win-win for the American people. So with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions any of you have about how we did it, um, what I see kind of um, into the future, um, what I think 2020 um, could, could bring in this discussion. Yeah, oh, yeah. Get down to business, man. Questions?